Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Hamry uh, uh, here at CSIS, and we have a real privileged opportunity this afternoon to feature some remarkably good work that's being done by our friends here in Washington, the American Academy of Diplomacy. Um, very, very proud of what work they do, and I have to say I'm privileged to be a member of the Academy. And they're, they're releasing today a very important report, and it's a report on bringing America's multilateral diplomacy into the 21st century. Now that may sound, you know, arcane, but let me just frame this just a second. You know, every really complex problem in the world is horizontal, and all the governments are vertical. And so think about it in the context of COVID. Uh, you know, COVID starts in uh, Wuhan, uh, China. You know, it gets to Europe within days. It's in the United States before we even know it. This is a problem that's going all around the world, and yet all of our governments approach things in a horizontal way, or in a vertical way. And this is one of the great challenges of modern society. You know, 300 years ago, it didn't matter, but now it does. And every complex problem that we have in the world is a horizontal problem. If it's pandemics, it could be um, illegal trafficking in women and children, it could be uh, drugs, could be money laundering, every complex problem is, is horizontal and our governments are vertical. Uh, so the challenge that we have in this age is how do we find ways as a society, human society, to deal with these problems that go beyond the reach of any one country's sovereign capacities. We have to find ways to coordinate and cooperate. And the, the work of this important commission highlights the imperative of having stronger preparation and planning and tools for multilateral diplomacy. Now, I'm, I'm only reading it and I'm a novice, but fortunately we have real experts with us today, and so I'm very privileged to Hi, Sherry, to could you please tilt your camera down so we could get a little Newman. less headroom? He head of the American Academy of Diplomacy, doing a fabulous job in, you know, expanding the frontiers of how diplomacy is so important for all of us thank you in America so much. today. So I want to say thank you to the American Academy of Diplomacy for letting us feature them today in what's a very important conversation. Thank you. Dr. Hammer, John, thank you very much for that introduction to the report. Very pleased to be here with you, and thank you for uh, putting this program on with us. You know, as, as you know, the Academy is a small organization, almost 40 years old, uh, formed by Henry Kissinger and a certain small number of people of similar uh, illustrious background. And it really has two missions today. It's still a small organization. It's still one composed of people who have done the hard work of making foreign policy work with foreigners, as opposed to, to just thinking about it. And uh, <coughs> it has two main lines of effort. One is to talk to Americans about why foreign policy is important, or why diplomacy is important, and what diplomacy is, not terribly well known always. And the other is to talk to the State Department, the U.S. government, about how it could do diplomacy better. And this report is very much in that second category. Grew out of internal discussions in the academy where we have a number of people who have worked on these subjects who were all pointing out that we have organized diplomacy primarily in bilateral terms, nation to nation but we have an increasing number of problems which are transnational, and Dr. Hamry mentioned a number of them, and which cannot in fact be dealt with effectively without cooperative relations between nations. Because frankly, as much as problems are transnational, nation states remain the basic actors. 
You can have a lot of NGOs, you can push for things, but if you do not bring nation states together to act, you really don't get much effective action. And our diplomacy has not been organized that way. And the offline view was, you're not doing a very good job. So we decided that was good, but we needed to be able to understand what it meant to do better. And that was the genesis of this report. And to talk about it today, I have Ambassador Joellen Powell, who was the driver of the report. She had lots of help, but she's the one who put it together. Uh, I have Dr. Sherry Goodman, who has a department uh, defense background as well, and because people think this is only just these soft guys over at the Pentagon, over at the Department of State, so we needed to uh, explain that the security dimensions of this are real. And we have Dr. Steve Morrison, uh, who really is an expert on the health field, much broader than that, but I'm giving you the capsule biography here. So, Joellen, I'd like to pass to you, if I may, and talk a little bit about how, you know, how we got here and who you talked to and uh, how you came to the conclusions that the game could be up substantially. Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. And thanks to all of our colleagues here at CSIS for hosting us today. It's terrific to be here. Ron's given you some background about the genesis of this project and, you know, why it is important that the U.S. engage multilaterally uh, to in address, uh, mitigate challenges and issues that are global in nature and that directly affect U.S. national interests and U.S. national security. So in taking on this, this project, uh, I had a lot of help from an advisory group, uh, people who have deep expertise in various aspects of multilateral diplomacy. Uh, I relied on them to steer me, uh, to help me with contacts, to reach out to diplomats in other countries, to plumb their practices, their best practices, their strategic planning processes, how they go about the business of multilateral diplomacy. And in doing this project, I, I focused really on, on three different kinds of U.S. engagement in multilateral fora. Uh, we, I looked at our missions to international organizations, which are our diplomatic representations to an international organization body, the U.S. mission to NATO, the U.S. mission to the U.N., the U.S. mission to the European Union, and others. I looked at our activity and presence within international organizations. Where are we in international bodies? Where are we active? Where have we either selected with, with careful thought or where have we sort of evolved organically over time to find ourselves in leadership positions in international organizations? And I looked at our role, presence, and activities in international conferences, such as the Law of the Sea, or the Arctic Council, or the Paris Climate Accords. The, the, the State Department is very active in all three of these arenas, and so those were my three areas of focus. Uh, with the help of my advisory group, I was able to talk to senior diplomats, very experienced in multilateral diplomacy, in a number of foreign uh, ministries. I talked to representatives from the UK, from France, Germany, uh, Denmark, Japan, maybe one or two others, but I wanted to glean from them how they view multilateral diplomacy, what, what priority they place on it, how do they train, prepare, assign, develop their cadre of multilateral experts. And in asking these questions of experts in the U.S., current practitioners in the field, in the State Department, and diplomats from other countries, I really focused on three aspects of multilateral diplomacy. The policy, the preparation, and the practice. So how do we decide what our, foreign what our multilateral imperatives are? How do we decide where we need to be? How do we prepare our diplomats 
for assignment in multilateral organizations? And how do we then develop that cadre of expertise through assignments, through recognition, through making sure that, that there is a, a logical flow of skills and knowledge is learned to pass on and bring back to the organization to strengthen the State Department's multilateral capacity overall. So basically what I learned was that both multilateral and bilateral diplomacy do not exist in silos. They do not operate side by side. They work better when they work together. And that we could do a better job of meshing, of having complementary bilateral and multilateral activity. It would strengthen both sides of our diplomatic engagement. And I think ultimately, if we have better understanding, better communication, and a clear idea of what our strategic objectives are, those will be the keys to upping our game in multilateral diplomacy. Thank you. I realize I left out one key point, which is many of you watching may have expected to see Nick Schiffer in oh, my yes. place. Obviously, I'm not <laughs> Nick Schiffer, and I'm Ambassador Ronald Newman. Uh, and that is because Nick, having been in uh, the Ukraine and having made it back on Sunday and all ready to do this program, then tested positive for COVID. And that is, of course, the excuse that nobody can argue with. And so <laughs> you have me instead. Uh, I'd like to pass now to Dr. Stephen Morrison. And Steve, you know, you've worked intensively on these broader health issues and you've seen it from a number of perspectives. And so I'd be very curious, uh, well, let you go ahead and, and start, but I also want to talk about where you think our game could be upped. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of words of thanks and congratulations. Congratulations to Ambassador Joe Allen Powell on this work. I mean, this is, this is an important piece of work. Uh, I encourage everyone to, to read it. Um, it, it. It's very helpful. It's very well done. You had an A-team on your committee, uh, many of the star diplomats that we've all come to know, and so congratulations. And special thanks to your staff, Ambassador Newman and the Academy, for putting this together, Maria Risehouse. Here on our team, there's a number of people. This is a new, this is a new operation we have here. Uh, Dr. Hamry created this space. But well, we've got a number of people who made this all happen. Mary Wright, Emma Colbrand, Stephen Welsh, Chris Healy. And special thanks to them. In terms of the question you put to me about uh, wh what's the State Department's role in multilateral diplomacy when it comes to health security or global health? And can it up its game? OK. A couple quick answers to that, and we can follow up. It's a mixed bag when you look at the last couple of decades in which you've had pandemics, you've had HIV, You've had uh, pandemic flu, you've had Zika, Ebola, now the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, great interest, rising interest in infectious disease, rising interest in the, in the broader field of global health. Um, State Department, I'll say a, a few things. State Department has definitely uh, contributed in very key moments multilaterally, but it's been very uneven, very fragmented. Oftentimes, the space has been left open for others to lead at the White House, at DOD, at NIH, and at Health and Human Services Glo Office of Global Affairs. There's been a vacuum of a kind at many critical moments. And in fact, the biggest returns that we get are not where State Department leads, but more where the President of the United States leads. There's many instances of that. Here at CSIS, we have a commission on strengthening America's health security. We issued, we've been ongoing now for almost four years, issued a big white paper in January. What was its main conclusion? It was that the State Department needed to create a serious, well-staffed and well-empowered structure of leadership on our global health security approaches. We made some concrete suggestions along those lines. And it needs a strategy and a long-term budget to match that in health security. We're at a risk right now that the pandemic is moving out of emergency into endemic phase and that we're going to suffer another bout of moving from crisis to complacency. And a decision moment is approaching the Secretary of State on how to reorganize the department to give it greater to up its game. And there's a couple of options on the table. We can talk about those later. Uh, but it's coming to the Secretary's desk end of this month, early next month. 
And, and so it's a big moment of decision. We look at the big decisions, the, the big achievements that were made. PEPFAR and the Global Fund were both created 20 years ago as companions, a bilateral and a multilateral initiative where U.S. leadership was responsible on both. Those two structures have been the dominant backbone of global response around HIV, TB, malaria. And under Peter Sands' leadership, the Global Fund has, been, has amplified and augmented its leadership uh, in responding to the pandemic with U.S. support. We've made massive investments, three and a half billion out of the ARP towards the response. So we have a record of great achievement on that. But it wasn't led by State Department. Um, PEPFAR, the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, is based at the State Department and it was put there for a reason and that over time created great expertise across our missions, 30 missions, where most of those funds were spent and the like. Um, but the idea of global health diplomacy being centered within that Office of, global, uh, of the Global AIDS Response languished, but we now have an opportunity. We have John and Kengazang, uh, Dr. John and Kengazang coming forward to the United States, about to be confirmed, head of the Africa CDC, coming back to the United States to take up his duties as the head of the Office of Global AIDS Coordination. He brings an enormous expertise in multilateral diplomacy in this era, and we have a great opportunity to build on that. Um, there has been lots of fragmentation within the State Department. Um, the capacities at the uh, uh, Bureau of OES, of Oceans, Energy, and Sciences, there's a number of, uh, a, a strong cadre of technical experts, but it's embedded, it's secondary status within that department. We've relied overwhelmingly on temporary envoys. We've done that most recently. Gail Smith served very honorably and effectively as an interim coordinator at the department in the Secretary's Office of Global Health Security, and she's exited. Um, that, is, that is simply unacceptable. And look at some of the powerful instances where we have suffered and paid a huge price by errors or omissions on global health security. Obviously, the biggest stumble was former President Trump attacking WHO, severing the relationship, throwing WHO in the midst of the pandemic into an existential crisis, associating it with the, or throwing it into the toxic meltdown in our relationship with China. We're trying to build back from that, and that is a building trying to dig ourselves out of that, that huge damage to our multilateral standing is still with us. It's still a big, it's a big, uh, a big challenge. There is now motion uh, for developing a new treaty, a pandemic treaty. Germany and, 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 and France have led the way with strong support from the African contingent, strong support from Dr. Tedros, head of WHO. The U.S. has entered, entered that process late without a clear strategy. They've helped bring it around to what we think are our interests, but it's been an embarrassment, frankly, the, de the degree, the approach that we've taken to that. When we restored our relationship with WHO, the day of President Biden's inauguration, it was Tony, it was Tony Fauci who delivered a very eloquent statement and a very powerful statement to WHO saying, we are back, we are a partner, we are a full partner. It's not the Department of State. That, that did that. Uh, I talked about the pandemic tree. The last thing I'd say is that look at the president's September 21st summit on health security. Was it adequately prepared? Did it get the returns that we needed? And the answer is no. Uh, Afghanistan cast, set things back and almost destabilized it. We didn't have the capacity at the State Department to do the level of multilateral di diplomatic preparations for it. It was rushed, and the returns were pretty minimal. Uh, and to answer Ambassador Newman's charge, give us a concrete instance of the price we pay where we don't have leadership and capacity. That's a pretty vivid one. And I think these other instances that I've said, but I'll stop there. I do think we should talk about the options that are coming before the uh, Secretary of State, because this is a big moment in which the questions that are in this study are going to be on the table. Thank you. We certainly hope they get some answers. Well, I'm very happy that we're joined, albeit remotely, with uh, Dr. Sherry Goodman to bring in yet another dimension of this whole broad issue of uh, multinational diplomacy. Uh, Sherry's background is primarily in defense, although 
quite broad. So, Dr. Goodman, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, ambassadors, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. And, and thank you, Ambassador uh, Joel and Powell, for your leadership on this study uh, with the distinguished group. Um, and it's a pleasure to join you at uh, CSIS. Uh, John Hamry and I served together both on the Senate Armed Services Committee staff and at the Defense Department. Um, and I have devoted much of my um, life to working at the nexus of national security, environment, climate, energy, and water security. Uh, and, and that really is the um, epitome of a challenge in the global commons uh, that requires us um, to address matters not in a stovepipe fashion as between either one single agency uh, or even within uh, one department, but in an integrated fashion. And I, th I think I've seen my experience over the years is that we can really, we can rise to that challenge. We have been moving in that direction, but we have to push ourselves because the system from which uh, we start would drive us to work in a more, um, uh, not to work in a more integrated way, which reflects the, the complex and converging risks. Because we know now that even while we're in the midst of the most horrendous crisis uh, since uh, World War II and the Ukraine crisis and Putin's war on the, on the West um, and an attempt at energy blackmail, that, for example, the climate crisis, the health crisis, they haven't gone away. So we have to be able to uh, walk and chew gum. So I will, um, I'll just share, you know, a, a, one experience from my own, my own past and then uh, a ways in which I think we can um, address these challenges uh, better today using some of the recommendations from this uh, very important report uh, to integrate these challenges of um, environment and security across various domains. So uh, at the end of the Cold War, I worked on helping to denuclearize the Soviet Union. And I uh, led a program called Arctic Military Environmental Cooperation uh, with the militaries of then Russia, if you can believe it now, Norway and, and others in the US to help reduce the nuclear threat. I wish we'd gone even further so there was less nuclear risk uh, or chemical biological risk that we face today. But we did so in an interagency, we formed interagency teams in the, in the U.S. led by defense, but with Department of Energy and EPA uh, and other agencies. And uh, of course, state diplomatically had to bless all that we did. Um, but I, th I would say probably didn't see itself very much as part of this initiative since it had uh, originated from the ministers of defense of Norway uh, with the U.S. Secretary of Defense bringing uh, Russia, who was very willing uh, partner in that time to receive funding uh, to reduce waste streams from its decommissioned and sunken uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, so now fast forward into the uh, climate era. You know, there's nothing you can do about climate change without uh, a multilateral diplomatic effort, whether it's the International Panel on Climate Change, whether it's the big conference on the parties on climate um, that has been ably led by um, uh, you know, the former Secretary of State, now John Kerry, uh, John Kerry is in the special representative's office, and many other um, international environmental treaties from uh, biodiversity, uh, uh, from the Arctic Council, which Joellen, you mentioned, which is not an environmental treaty, but it's an environmental, it's a governance organization uh, that has until recently served ably well for the last quarter century to provide a way to cooperate on Arctic matters, of course, also affected um, by Putin's war on Ukraine right now. Um, but I would say all these ways in which we continue need to continue to address everything from oceans to biodiversity, to climate, energy, and water need to be done in a way that gives more presence and lift to um, historically the sort of some of the functional areas of of the Department of State, as opposed to the regional areas where the power has always vested. And it also means that integrating awareness into this, as the um, this administration is trying to do on climate, to sort of have climate smart policies and climate literate workforce across every agency means that all the regional bureaus also have to integrate this type of learning and, and awareness 
Uh, and that means working in a much more integrated way. So I take, uh, and I'm very much involved in helping the State Department do that through various educational forums now or service on other commissions and boards. And I think that the work of this, um, uh, of this study will help further that. One area I finally mentioned last is the Global Fragility Act, uh, which I think is, is very important also uh, law now very much in the State Department, I think the province of, of the Conflict and Stabilization Office, but one that really requires harnessing um, the capabilities across the State Department and across the interagency um, to identify what are the root causes of fragility across various states and regions, and then how to get after that with an integrated set of um, actions, uh, interventions, and steps that will reduce those uh, fragility risks, whether they result from climate or corruption or um, cyber risks or poor governance or the whole suite of risks that we know so afflict uh, nations in the 21st century. Thank you. Jerry, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to, I'm going to do a few questions, privilege of the moderator, and then we're going to pick up. I need to remind everybody that you can ask questions uh, online. There's a button to press, and you can fill in your question, and we'll get them over here. We'll get to as many of those as we can. But uh, I wanted to start with, with Joelle, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a, a kind of a two sides of the same question. Where did you find the greatest lacks in the State Department, and what recommendations out of the many in the report do you deem the most important? <laughs> Obviously, they're all important. But. Well, of course. I, I think at a very fundamental level, the, the greatest shortcoming is in communication, very simply. Uh, you know, as, as my colleague Sherry alluded, you know, the, the regional bureaus march to their own drum and the functional bureaus march to their own drum. And all too often, they're not communicating well with each other. Uh, I'm sure part of that is a function of having more on your plate than you can possibly digest in a day or a week. But communication and collaboration of a very basic level within the department and on a broader level within the interagency is, is going to be uh, critical to, to success in, in these very complex issues. Um, so among the recommendations that, that we had, I think uh, recommendations that address preparation for service in multilateral organizations and that, uh, that try better to bring out the, the depth of competencies that reside in our civil service, in our functional bureaus, uh, to increase the, the exchange of information, knowledge, skills, between the two parts of the Department of State that are, are working, we hope, in tandem uh, on these global issues is probably the most important takeaway. Well, that would make sense to me. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed over time is that effective liaison and cooperation is not a natural human tendency. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. This was illustrated for me when I was ambassador in Algeria. We were under a blanket death threat to all foreigners. The embassy was very stripped down. I think we only had about 33 people, and two-thirds of them carried guns. So I had about 12 substantive officers, and we all lived in the same compound. And you still had to really work to make sure people coordinated. Yeah. Uh, so it, it clearly, and, and they were all friendly. It's just it's not natural. Um, Moving across, Steve, you've worked so many of these health issues. There's a lot that's been done, probably a lot more that can be done on greater public-private partnerships 
particularly in health, feel all over the developmental issues, but particularly in health. Where do you see, or do you see places where if the U.S. was better organized in its multilateral diplomacy, that it would be able to uh, bring out more of this public-private partnership strength? Thank you very much. Um, I think there's a, uh, the first <coughs> comment I'd make is that technologically, in this next phase, we're going to need better vaccines. We're going to need ones that are pan-coronavirus vaccines. We're going to need deeper and longer-lasting immune protection. We're going to need all of those. On therapies, we've had a couple of very promising breakthroughs on antivirals and monoclonal antibodies, but we're going to need the next generation. We don't have enough. We need, we need to accelerate. We need greater diversity on testing. We're going to need the next generation there. Okay, most of the funding and, and, and technical thinking is going to come out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House and uh, along with NIH. But there are deep issues around equity uh, and access that require the private sector to come forward and, and agree to a set of principles around how this is going to happen. And that's front and center within the, this new process, intergovernmental negotiation, around what may become a pandemic treaty or a pandemic instrument of some kind. That process is just beginning. The United States is part of it. It's supposed to culminate in the World Health Assembly in 24, 2024. So that's one area where U.S. leadership uh, uh, with public-private partnerships in mind can, can really achieve something. They did something on the pandemic flu that was quite valuable in getting industry to come forward with promises of greater disclosure and cooperation uh, and, and greater equity and access. That has been a huge problem. I would add into that that we're gonna need much greater emphasis on surveillance networks that bring the private sector in, uh, genomic sequencing. There's hubs emerging globally. Some of those are private sector hubs. They're going to be, need to be integrated and linked. We need distributed manufacturing capacity. We're seeing some promising uh, developments in South Africa, Morocco, uh, Senegal, uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, South Africa, Morocco, Senegal. We need more of that. We need more energy around that. And the private sector with the, and U.S. multilateral diplomacy can help us move that forward. The other thing I'd say in terms of role of private, sec private sector partnerships is we need to think ahead about this war this Russian invasion and war within Ukraine. Uh, it could, it's, going to, it's going to destroy much. It's already destroying much of the civilian infrastructure, including the medical system. And the reconstruction is going to rely upon private sector partners uh, to, to Ukrainian and non-Ukrainian American and other private sector partners. If we wind up, we already have three million refugees uh, in, in, crossing into Europe. We've got another four to five million that are displaced and not sleeping in their homes and not sure how they move. We could wind up with upwards of a third of, of Ukraine uh, outside of Ukraine. And that is going to pose not just resettlement and restabilization uh, challenges, but also challenges around infectious disease control and, and, and immunization programs and the like. And it's going to involve a lot of private sector partners uh, in that effort. The EU. Uh, is scrambling like crazy to try and put a plan together and move forward. In recent months, in this administration, there's been some significant gains in U.S.-European cooperation in these matters, and there's been a very explicit emphasis in using that enhanced cooperation to bring the private sector in. And I think this is going to fit, frankly, in that. And we'll see more discussion in the German presidency of the G7, We'll see more in the G20 under Indonesia as well on some of these matters. But there's opportunities and there's clear, some clear pressing priorities that, that lend themselves to this. Well, you know, in, as I was listening to your answer, I was thinking that obviously having U.S. leadership on the policy level is extremely important mm -hmm. to all these moving pieces of governments and private sector organizations. Yep. But the policy doesn't mean much unless you have the hard, nitty-gritty work principally of diplomacy writ large 
to keep cobbling all these pieces together. Otherwise, you're just speaking, you know, one voice among a multitude of voices. Right. And it takes a lot of coordination, a lot of individual work to knit the policy together into action in the field. And that leads me to a question that I wanted to pose to, to Sherry Gooden, which is, in your experience, how do defense and state and aid work how do they how well do they collaborate together in these kinds of fields and how would the recommendations uh, assuming they would in the report improve that well uh, thank you uh, Ron you know historically and in my time in in defense in the Clinton administration you know there was often a lot of competition between state and defense between OSD policy and State Department policy planning, you know. Um, but I would say that today, uh, particularly in the areas that I now work in most closely, climate, energy, water security, there is enormous amount of cooperation. I, I just came off a meeting uh, where we had uh, state defense, USAID, uh, NOAA, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. We had representatives from other agencies, from NGOs, and we we're all trying, we we're all working on trying to uh, create, and the White House, um, all trying to work on improved uh, solutions for tackling uh, climate insecurities, but also corruption and a whole suite of problems in the Latin America Triangle, addressing migration and the whole suite of challenges there. So I think there's an understanding now um, particularly against with the emerging generation of practitioners in this field, um, from diplomats to defense to development, and even I would include disaster risk in this now very much. Really, it's not just a 3D problem anymore, it's a 4D problem, um, that we need to work together and we have to find integrated solutions. So I am, and I see even within state that in this area, um, folks are coming together, bringing their the folks from the regional office together with the folks from whether it's CSO or OES or whichever other functional part of state come together with the regional bureaus. And I, I think that's incredibly important and that's the way we have to work uh, together in the future. And I think people are much more open it, to that today uh, perhaps than in the past. And so the timing is right um, to integrate and really institutionalize of new ways of working together. Well, that leads directly into a question in the uh, question line from Ambassador Tony Wayne, uh, which is partially to Ambassador Powell Gerland. How well do we build this in, this training for multilateral diplomacy? How well do we build that in to our diplomats? And then um, that's kind of a softball. But uh, and then, but then more broadly, the question really is to to all three of you. In your experience, do we have enough staff and funding to add strong health and environmental diplomacy to the U.S. arsenal? Okay. Well, starting with with training, uh, the the Foreign Service Institute, which is the the training arm of the Department of State, has a number of really very good and useful courses in its curriculum uh, available to officers who are headed out on multilateral assignments. But they tend to be focused, specific um, practicums rather than a broader baseline understanding of multilateral diplomacy. So there's some very good courses on uh, negotiating in a multilateral environment, for example, how the UN works, for example, where we don't see the training that we see in the German foreign ministry, in the Auswärtiges Amt, in the French foreign ministry, is a kind of continuum of training that goes all the way through an officer's career that emphasizes a broader understanding and a policy understanding of what the German 
policy priorities are, what the French policy priorities are. So in, in, in some of our European, uh, and Japan as well, some of their training uh, constructs, they, they put a lot more emphasis on sort of the ongoing professional education level and less on the sort of spot skills training that is a strength of FSI, no question about it. But I think I would like to see more at entry level, at mid to level, certainly at the senior threshold uh, when we graduate from being foreign service officers to becoming senior executives, senior foreign service officers, a broader integration, not just of why multilateral diplomacy import is important, but what are our priorities mm -hmm. now? And how do I you, mean, a hard focused and, policy and how, do you, how do you do it? No, exactly. And, I mean, listening is supposed to be one of those key diplomatic skills, and if you don't know where even your allies are, it gets really hard to shape policy in ways that bring them on board. Indeed. Uh, but I wanted to go on to Steve and, and to uh, Sherry to ask this question. In your experience, how adequate have you found the just the numbers of people and resources that state brings to its role in this area? Well, um, now be honest. I would say that um, in recent years, we've seen in the OES Bureau and the Oceans Energy Sciences Bureau, uh, those that are, uh, we've seen a, a significant increase in the, in the technical capacity, the expertise relevant to global health security. Um, and so um, that is, that capacity has, has, has been enlarged significantly. We have the legacy of, of the uh, Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator mm -hmm. and, and the muscle and the fact that there's significant resources against that and there's a strong tie-in to the Global Fund. And we have now a very significant player in John and Ken, in Ken Kazong, and um, Dr. And Ken Kazong coming in as the leader shortly in the next, in the next few weeks. Um, there's a lot of talent and capacity scattered in key places. You look at our embassy in Geneva, you look at the US-UN, uh, that bring enormous commitment and expertise and, and knowledge. And I think you can identify, you can go and look in the Secretary's own office and see this. But what, it, what is missing is a authoritative structure within the State Department with a direct line to the Secretary that can really pull these pieces together and lead. And what I've what I've emphasized is, in the absence of that, other agencies lead. Mm -hmm. Others come in and lead where the State Department should be leading and is not. And so this becomes this moment where uh, it could be fixed. It could be fixed in a variety of ways, and that's where we get back to the, to the models that are now being tabled in terms of reform that would upgrade the State Department capacities. But right now, a core, a core strong and authoritative capacity is missing. And what we do have are important elements that are fragmented and scattered. And Dr. Goodman, does, does your experience and your ongoing, not just in defense, but your ongoing work, does it, does it reflect this scattering that Dr. Morrison was talking about? Well, I, I, I think to some extent as we've, um, and maybe as, as the as state and other agencies have built out their capacity to tackle these more complex um, challenges we face, um, we haven't figured out how to fully integrate uh, across areas. I'll just give one example that's very that's pressing today, with in which is the Arctic. Um, we are the only Arctic nation that doesn't have a dedicated. Arctic ambassador. We have a special representative for the Arctic, um, and when um, and we we've managed to put some very good you know talent people the people in, you know working these um, in this area are quite capable, but we we haven't um, fig and right now there is legislation pending. Um, 
by Congress to create a dedicated Arctic ambassador. And uh, I think the State Department still has to figure out how it wants to do that and to create the resources uh, for that within the State Department. But that's an area that calls upon uh, where we have a many challenges, potential spillover from the war in Ukraine, Russia's nuclearization and military buildup in the Arctic to the need for sustainable development and the fact that climate change has created a whole new ocean in our lifetime. Um, and so we have much, we need to up our game in that region in many ways, uh, diplomatically, militarily, economically, um, and environmentally in a whole variety of ways. And so we need to bring the diplomatic resources to bear so that we can have, we can be on par with at least our key um, Arctic allies like Canada, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, and the others um, in, in representing ourselves in the key, in key forums from the Arctic Council and beyond. So that's just one, that's just one example. Uh, I think we'll probably, will be moving in that direction. It's inevitable. Uh, but then you have to figure out how to make how to how to make those uh, challenges and integrate successfully within the rest of the capabilities across state and the other agencies. That's a really good example because when people tend to think multilateral diplomacy, they may think that oh, it sounds kind of airy fairy, um, and and then the Arctic. That's well, that's someplace out there, but that's not on anybody's front. But and then you think, you know, wait a minute, we got a new ocean. We got the Russians with a major involvement. We've got the Chinese calling themselves a near Arctic power. Uh, maybe we better pay some attention. Uh, so I'm glad you, glad you brought that up. Yeah, we need to bring the same weight and power uh, to the table on Arctic issues that other nations are. And, and yes, China also sees itself very much as an Arctic player. So this is a region where we have to defend our, our sovereignty and our national interests. Um, and and when, with no disrespect to a excellent ally, friend, and colleague, when you say the U.S. needs to get its game up to equal the Danes, I think you've explained something about the quality of our, or the totality of our effort. Uh, so, there's a question here from uh, Taryn Kennedy, who is an intern at SFRC, and the question, I don't know who exactly has the, the background of this, the question is how could the United States and Europe cooperate for stronger alliances with African partners. Uh, and we're going to have to move along because we're running out of time. Uh, who feels like they could take I'll a, take a okay. first stab. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think in, in the multilateral context, you know, part of the dynamic of, of being uh, at uh, a representative to a multilateral organization, such as being the U.S. ambassador to UNESCO or the U.S. ambassador to, to uh, the United Nations organizations in Vienna, is all about network building. Some of it is tactical, some of it is strategic. But Look at Linda Thomas-Greenfield at the UN at the General Assembly vote 141 to 5. That is diplomacy at work. And you build those contacts and you build those relationships. And yes, those, those relationships that you build can carry into new alliances uh, with Africa, with Latin America, with blocks that have specific interests that may uh, overlap to a greater or lesser degree with ours, but where we find those those overlaps of common interest, then the relationships you build working on one issue can easily be brought to address another issue. And I think the multilateral fora are an excellent, excellent place to do that. Just watching my own husband who was at UNESCO making the rounds to consult with Caribbean countries, to consult with Sub-Saharan African countries, to consult with Maghreb countries on finding common ground for a specific issue made it so much easier later on to go back to those colleagues and say, we have a new issue we can agree on these things, what else can we agree on? And that's what diplomacy is. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to keep us moving along since we're going to run out of time pretty okay. soon. I have a question specifically for, uh, for Steve Morrison from uh, Jeffrey Allen at the University of Maryland. And he says that we all agree the pandemic has been a wake-up call for the international community. 
How can the U.S. multilateral diplomacy help to establish an early warning system, radar information exchange for pandemics in not more than two minutes? Wow. We are currently at CDC building a new surveillance, surveillance and forecasting capacity. It's been well funded through the American Rescue Plan. Um, there are similar initiatives on early detection, surveillance, and forecasting. The Germans are funding the Berlin office uh, with WHO. We have um, initiatives uh, that are EU-wide. We have the Rockefeller Foundation. We have others that are doing this. So there's a lot of, of, of initiatives that are global in orientation, but they're not knit together and integrated and harmonized yet in their approaches, and we don't have a concrete plan for that. Uh, and that's a subject of actually a dinner we're hosting here this evening, which is how do you move from that? We have our own domestic problems in trying to get our states synced up and making greater investments and cooperating with CDC on our own surveillance and response capacity. But we have aspirations to move towards hubs uh, around the world that will be integrated but we're not there yet, and we don't have an action plan with clear targets uh, and expectations, but we're getting closer to that. So I'm hopeful, actually, that as a consequence of this pandemic, we will see much more progress in that regard. That was under two minutes. But. That was excellent, very focused. Um, I'm gonna run two questions together here uh, and give everybody a last, a last quick crack as we go around. One uh, from Ambassador Deborah McCarthy is more or less specifically to Ellen, but uh, to Joellen, but others might want to have a crack. And that is, what do China, what are China and Russia doing in multilateral fora to advance their interest? Where is the U.S. at a, where do you see the U.S. at a disadvantage? Um, and the other question that Ellen Leifson has asked, and. Uh, she points out that State Department officers are usually enablers and facilitators, not necessarily the authorities on topics like health and climate. Does the report address how to integrate experts from other agencies or from the NGO world at U.S. missions to multinational institutions? So the first is where do the Russia and China. where do Russia and China outplay us, and second is how do we bring on the expertise we need? I'll let you go first and. That'll okay, wrap us up. and we'll do it really quickly. Um, I think in, in the course of, of talking to people for this report, the country that stood out most clearly as playing a long strategic game is China. Uh, looking at where they have influence, where they can shape outcomes, uh, such as setting standards for international telecommunications, uh, G5, you know, the things that have an impact on every single piece of everyday life. And they have dedicated enormous resources to staffing embassies, uh, both bilateral and multilateral missions. They are in multilateral organizations. They are present at every level from interns to secretaries general. Uh, I didn't see that quite so much with Russia. Uh, and certainly I think the latest uh, UN vote would tell me that Russia has maybe not played this hand quite so well. Uh, but certainly in the past, Russia has, has used international organizations to, as its bully pulpit uh, to rally non-aligned states, to uh, marshal support for things against uh, the United States. And I think where we could do better is to, first of all, think strategically about where our voice counts most, and then make a very direct effort to try to position ourselves uh, where we can be in the room where it happens, in the room where the decisions are made instead of reacting to decisions made by others. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to go to Sherry and come back to Steve because the NGO question is a little separate. But have you seen, Sherry, in your operations, have you seen areas where the Russians and Chinese are outplaying us? Well, I, I certainly agree that China plays the long game. 
You know, it's uh, on the Arctic, for example, it's an active observer of the Arctic Council. It's not a member. It's not one of the Arctic coastal states, but it's engaged and it, it, it gets engaged in all the in all the forums um, and uh, also on the Central Arctic Fisheries Memo you know, Agreement, which was signed several years ago. One might say that they have, a, you know, a long term ambition of understanding um, emerging fish fishing opportunities as fish migrate more towards northern latitudes since uh, they are a major, uh, uh, you know, a major global fishing country. And then there raises all the issues about illegal and underreported fishing. Um, so I, I think there are many, there are a number of, of, of forms where um, they've, they've participated quietly and uh, we don't always, we, we haven't always seen that. Um, I think Russia is different. I agree with Joel, and maybe they've maybe they haven't played their hand very well, uh, create a lot of devastation and destruction now. Um, and and I think we need you know we we need to be able to play you know play the long game in a variety of other forms as as well. And I think I'll uh, and as with respect to you know Africa, we need to think about the needs of those countries uh, there and have ourselves more involved. Um, in, in the variety of forms that help us uh, set stability and governance across that vast and important continent uh, for the future. Thank you. Well, we're almost out of time. We're actually probably are out of time. We might run a minute over, but uh, Dr. Morrison, if, if you could say a few minutes, just a few words about the ability of state to draw on the resources of NGOs and others and to bring them into the game to, to supplement the generalist with this particular skills or whether that is as much an issue as one might perceive it to be? Well, in the field of, in the broad field of global health, of course, domestic and international NGOs are the, are the main implementers and they remain operationally mm -hmm. terribly important part, partners in many different ways. Um, and so when you look programmatically at what we do, um, they are they have been there they remain vitally important and we have to listen to them and we have to make sure that 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 uh, we have the capacity that we need on global health security on the pandemic preparedness on the pandemic response um, they have also uh, proven to be uh, very very important players and will remain so so I I don't think we're fighting a fight in seeing the value and legitimacy and centrality of them as partners with the United States. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a given. I think we could do far better, frankly, on global health security in mobilizing private sector interests and NGOs to be lobbying for the United States to have a higher capacity and a higher engagement multilaterally and a greater capacity at the Department of State. We've been too inclined over these last several years to let the White House lead or to let uh, USAID lead or to uh, a C, uh, HHS Office of Global Affairs lead when State Department has not been at the table. Um, it would be good to hear their voices asking for greater capacity al along this agenda that we've been talking about right now. Thank you. I, I think... would just add a footnote in the environmental space. Uh, environmental NGOs have long been well integrated into international environmental diplomacy, working with State Department and other parts of the U.S. government. So I, I think those are relationships that do work and they continue to be vibrant, whether we're talking oceans, fisheries, climate, water security. Um, a lot of expertise in that vast NGO community and a lot of it is accessed on a regular basis. That's a good positive note to close on since I note that we're slightly over time. Uh, I, I think clearly we could continue. There's a lot of meat in this area. I think one thing that you all have come back to again and again is that we have a lot of expertise in the U.S. government and the private sector, but there, it, the idea that you can just continually pass the ball from agency to agency to agency, <laughs> depending on the problem, and not have your foreign affairs agency integrating the pieces with the foreigners is probably mm -hmm. a serious weakness that needs to be remedied. And 
So I encourage people to read the full report. I believe it is uh, the link to it was on the invitation. Mm -hmm. So if you had the, if you're here, you actually have a link, and you can go back and find it. But you can also find it on the website of the American Academy of Diplomacy, uh, right up at the top. I really, really want to thank Joel and Powell who guided the effort to produce this report. Ambassador Powell, thank you. Dr. Morrison for bringing your great expertise okay. in the health field into this discussion, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Goodman for reminding us of how many security dimensions uh, writ large there are in this multinational, multifunctional world that we need to pay attention to. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to CSIS and John Hamry for hosting us here. And thank you for all of those who tuned in to watch.